Let's first allow a couple of questions to relate to Marike's paper. Andy, okay, please. Okay, um, as Marika said, I worked on the I worked on the consumption poverty story, and um, there is no doubt that this is a sort of Madagascar type problem as well. You, you're you're. It really depends on the particular years when the service happened to take place, and the harvest was not good in the last in the time of the second survey in 2005-06, and was was significantly better in 10-11, and. Price changes were another factor. These things, aren't, these things won't necessarily be the same in, in, in future. So you're just comparing two points in time. And the DHS may give you more of a sense of longer term change, but the poverty comparisons are just comparisons of the points that you have. Philip Renshins, by the way, also called me to Antwerp to explain the story and talk, talk about the story. But there's no doubt that the reality is that Marek is describing there of Rwanda, and she knows it very, very well, Extremely, uh, extremely accurate, and these, these these are real important issues. Thanks. Okay, there's another comment uh, question on related to uh, Marike. Yeah, thanks, uh, Omar McDoom from the London School of Economics. Um, so I also agree that the conclusion is is largely right that there is a mismatch between how people feel in Rwanda and what it is that the objective verifiable data is saying. And I think you're right that you are right to point to the to the role of the state and the authoritarian character of the, the regime that explains why it is that you do have some of these changes. I did want to ask, though, about inequality. And I know that you're measuring vertical inequality here. But I wondered what your sense was, at least from talking with your colleagues, about inequality between groups. And I don't just mean between Hutu and Tutsi, but also in between, between for example, returnees and people who were there from, uh, from before and after the genocide. And I wonder to what extent some of these findings are picking up the fact that some of the diaspora, the Tutsi diaspora, who returned from Uganda, from Tanzania, from the DRC, who have a much different perspective and may also have better opportunities in Rwanda coming back uh, to a regime that is largely pro-Tutsi in perception, whether in fact the data are picking up some of these trends. Okay, thank you. Um, Marike, would you like to respond? Uh, please uh, put it on. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, Omar, for this uh, question. Well, when I talk to people in Rwanda, there's certainly still a feeling that there are different groups and that some groups are receiving uh, favors uh, compared to other groups. Uh, so I think that um, this uh, inequality certainly, to some extent, relates to group identity and uh, probably the group you mentioned, so the old case of returnees, so those who returned from Uganda or in uh, in um, a, a good position to take advantage of uh, opportunities uh, compared to other groups. And um, I think that's something that I will add to the list uh, of future research. It's there actually, but in less overt terms, uh, um, because I think it's certainly possible to look at the DHS data and the ICV data and not look at the ethnic uh, ethnicity per se, because that's of course not uh, in there, but look at uh, other uh, char characteristics that relate to uh, group identity, such as you know the place where you were born or the languages that you speak. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. And surprisingly, we do have some time now for the general discussion related to any of these uh, four papers. And uh, so let's take a couple of questions first, and then allow the paper presenters to uh, respond. Yes. Okay, um, I'm Yongfu Fang from Wider. Um, my first question goes to Charlie, and I think your framework is very attractive, but what I'm concerned is the assumptions you are using. Uh, as we know, the traditional micro theory suggests when we look at the substitution effect, right, we basically look at two bundles within the same location, the same pe time period, and uh, also with the assumption of there's, there are no external shocks and there's no technology progress in other assumptions. Now, you're looking at the substitution effect <clears throat> at between two bundles across space over time. I suppose you must use some specific assumptions and also very strong assumptions. So I wonder if you could discuss the assumptions you are using and why you think the assumptions you are using are violated in the current context of globalization and financial crisis. Um, I'm not working on this area specifically, sorry. Uh, please excuse me if I'm wrong. 
My second question goes to the second speakers. Um, basically, you <coughs> decompose the inequality into real inequality and nominal inequality by looking at the inflation. And however, the inflation is some kinds of shocks which is homogeneous for all peoples, right? Basically, inflation represents some kinds of equal opportunity for all people. However, inequality is something about in, in equal opportunity. So I wonder if you could comment on the uh, justification of your approach by looking at the inflation and to decompose inequality. My third question goes to third speakers. And you basically study the poverty in the presence of external shocks, right? And actually, external shocks will have negative impact on growth and welfare. However, the external shocks will also have a um, negative impact on utility. It is just a bit strange for me to see you look at the utility which is consistent over time. Could you comment on that? Thank you. Okay, uh, the next question, and please be brief in the interest of time. Uh, there's a um, there's gentleman at the back, and, and, and then Finn. Uh, yeah, uh, Alan Thomas from the IMF. Uh, just a, a point on voice and accountability. Uh, we've just done some recent work on six uh, non-resource countries in Africa uh, to show that their growth has been very strong, and so the Africa story is not just commodities. Uh, this is Ethiopia, Rwanda, uh, Mozambique, and a few others. But uh, for all those countries, vice accountability has hardly changed uh, over the last 15 years. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm a bit more into uh, uh, the camp of uh, Martin Levan this morning, but it's not clear to me that, uh, you know, changes in vice accountability are essential for growth, obviously, in the very long run. People may not uh, be too thrilled about their situation, but. You know, if you're going to make a big picture about what's happening with voice and accountability, it might be good then to have surveys that people actually show that they're very unhappy with, you know, the, the current leadership. It's not clear to me from what you presented that that's necessarily the case here. Um, and it's certainly, you know, in terms of what's happened in the last 20 years, uh, you know, the correlation between voice accountability changes and growth uh, is probably, you know, zero. Okay, Finn. Thank, thank you very much, Pintar, from you and you wider. I, I, I thought the last paper sort of got me thinking about th th this sort of issue that, okay, you, you have objective, in quote, uh, material progress, and then still pe people feel sort of worse off. Um, I was attacked viciously in the Danish press uh, the day before yesterday because I have allowed myself to say that I think that the progress in Vietnam has been very significant and very substantial, and then there was a sociologist getting out there saying, oh, you haven't understood a thing because people are feeling worse off. Now, uh, it does sort of, I mean, obviously, then these research uh, topics are obviously relevant for us to pursue. But I think we might want to just reflect on a more immediate things. What do we then recommend to policymakers? That we should push on with the material stuff or, or, or what? I mean, I've, I'm sort of, uh, I mean, I have my own preferences, but I was just wondering whether you had any reflections on that. Okay, and one final question. <coughs> yeah, I also wanted to ask a, a non-empirical question that builds on what Finn just said. And it's almost a normative, almost a epistemological question, which is, if we ask ourselves the question, what are the normative foundations of why we think that inclusion and equality are important, then this helps us to understand better what it is that we are trying to measure and how we go about trying to measure it. So the epistemological dimension then becomes not allowing the data or the availability of the data to determine what it is that we measure and how we measure it, but allow theory to determine what it is that we do. So to push it just a little bit further, normatively we have to ask ourselves, why do we think these things matter? If the answer is simply because we think it's, it's fair because it's, equity is desirable, you know, it's consistent with liberal theory, then fine, you can go about measuring it any way you want. If the answer is, however, that it has something to do with, say, improving social stability in countries, then we do have to ask ourselves a different, ask ourselves a different set of questions. So the three things, I suppose, and I think Michael and Finn picked this out, 
first of all, whether we want to look at subjective versus objective measures of, of well-being and welfare, whether we want to look not just at a quality of, of, of outcomes, which is what some of you have looked at, but also a quality of opportunity, and I know you looked at non-monetary measures here, and also, lastly, at, uh, at differences between groups, not just vertical inequality, but horizontal inequalities as well, if they are, in fact, tied to to grievances and senses of, um, of frustration within societies. So that question, I suppose, is to anybody who wants to tackle the normative foundations of this project. Okay, excellent. Now we have uh, tough, tough questions to answer in, uh, in two minutes' time, but let's, let's do our best. So what if we take in the, the, the terms we had the papers presented? So, Janine, do you want to start? Uh, I'll start. There was a comment by um, Martin with respect to uh, David, which was this iterative procedure, and, and in fact, we do that. Um, that's the first thing we do, is, is the iterative procedure. And then we still end up with, with uh, and we do that iterative procedure with great pain, I would have. <laughs> and then we go on and, and correct. So uh, the iterative procedure is nice, but it doesn't get you uh, to, to uh, not have revealed preference violations. Um, on preferences, um, you know, preferences are preferences. They're, they're, they're not a, a function of technology. Uh, you know, they're, this is, uh, they're, they're out there, at least uh, not in theory. Um, in, in practice, we have to be clear on what we're talking about. We're talking about pumpkin leaves, cassava, some dried fish, uh, some maize meal, uh, and, and people, uh, you know, a few vegetables and some fruit, and people making uh, substitutions across these in order to be able to basically eat enough. Uh, and, and so I think this is, there are preferences that are, that are going on here, but it's, it's quite clear that uh, people at, at these levels of income will substitute when, when a cheaper calorie source that, that's good enough uh, becomes available. And, and, you know, the willingness of, of Mozambicans to eat a lot of yellow maize is a pretty good example of that. I mean, it's just not that desirable, but they will do it if it's a, if it's a, if it's a cheap source of, of food. Um, Oh, I wanted to mention something on uh, uh, these, these perceptions. And I, I run into this as well. So I think this is really common. Um, and, and I developed some views. I mean, for example, uh, Mozambique, 96 to 2003, we had a lot of poverty reduction, but uh, uh, you know, lots of people uh, stating that they, they, they don't, they feel worse off. And, uh, and, and a couple of reasons for that, I think, are one, the, the time frame is, is different. Right? Normally when they're asking these perception questions, it's relative to last year. And, and we're measuring more over, over time. Um, the other is I think that, that there is a, a uh, it's just in human psychology, uh, we, we are relative, we work in relatives. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't think in absolute terms. And, and so this is, I think, another reason, and, and this is exactly what Marjik was, was saying. Um, so uh, I'll end it there. Okay, excellent. Then perhaps we should incorporate those relative um, uh, terms into our measurement as well. So that's one pot potential avenue. Murray? Uh, so a simpler question, I think, uh, was really about, so what's, what's the, as I understood the question, was really about why bother with these uh, adjustments, uh, as I understood the question. And, and, uh, and I can answer pretty strongly that isn't it worthwhile actually looking at what people are consuming? So consumption and expenditures are a, are a very important measure of well-being. They're the, the preferred measure in the money metric world. Uh, so actually understanding what people are consuming and how their prices have moved would seem to me to be extraordinarily important. Uh, so finding out that in our case, for example, that uh, so you can find anything. Right? But in our case, we find that food prices, and which are very, very important to those at the bottom end of the income distribution, and even things like uh, uh, electricity and housing, which have come as public delivery items from government, uh, have the prices of those things have moved in a way that's detrimental to the guys right at the bottom of the distribution. Why is that any less important than any other uh, negative impact on the people that we're supposed to be trying to help, I guess? Okay. okay, David? Um, I have to admit, I didn't quite catch the question. Uh, you asked uh, the negative effects, um, negative shocks effect on, I missed that last part. I have to admit, sorry. 
Okay. Skip. We'll just pass it on. Okay. 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 All right. Uh, do you want to respond to the broader questions? No, I think. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you need more time to yes. that. Yes. Okay. Uh, Marika? Yeah. So I received a question or a comment from the uh, sir with a yellow shirt in the back and from Finn and also from Omar. And I think it's all boiled down to voice and accountability. Now, I, I don't think that in the case of Rwanda, voice and accountability is a necessary condition for economic growth. We have seen that very, very clearly. Uh, at the same time, a lack of voice and, uh, and accountability also allows the government to implement transformative changes in a very rapid way, and these transformative changes are arguably uh, very necessary. Uh, so I think if we care about growth alone and growth in the short run or in the medium run, I don't think voice and accountability is a constraint. But I think one needs to reflect on other measures also and whether we want to care about them or whether we care about them and also about the long term. And I think here Omar's comment uh, about group identity and horizontal inequalities is very important. And I also point out to the fact that um, many historians and political scientists working on Rwanda say that there is a strange and disturbing continuation of uh, policies, uh, economic uh, and political, in Rwanda prior to the genocide and now, in the sense that also prior to the genocide, the donor community was excited about Rwanda, and there was also no vo voice and, uh, and accountability, and they were excited about the development progress in Rwanda. I'm not yet convinced that there is like a perfect continuation. I still you know, reflect on that, and I think that there are also many, many differences uh, which are very important. And Let's not forget that the genocide was a huge shock, shock that affected all aspects of the society and maybe have changed the mindset of people. So I, I'm not convinced that there is just a simple continuation. And uh, so for me, it's very difficult at, it po at this point to say whether one should oppose the lack of force and accountability in Rwanda or not. I'm still working on that, reflecting on that. And so I'm uh, prepared to, to have a discussion about it later on with you. Okay. Thank you so much once again, and, and now uh, it's time to uh, proceed for the lunch.